All right, um, we're going to take a few notes on this stuff today. Um, yesterday, if you were gone, we covered basically we covered everything from three-dimensional objects, like the basic names of the shapes. The only thing we didn't really go into very well was how to name like a prism or a pyramid. But we went through all the different platonic solids. Those are the very, very special types of polyhedra, uh, three-dimensional objects. So we went through those. Uh, today is to get to um, you know how to name a prism, how to name a pyramid one more time to give you the formal ways of doing it, and then to really get to some formulas and give you some kind of some little bit of history and stuff. Uh, there's a little bit of history and um, ancient stuff in here that I kind of mixed in there because I thought it was kind of fun. It was kind of a, kind of a good way to do it. So uh, we're gonna get to that. So make sure you have your notes out. Goal today is to take notes. I don't think we're gonna get homework today. I kind of was contemplating if we're gonna get to homework today, but I don't have all my geometry classes today. Mm. It's seventh period. I don't have that. So. Um, tomorrow we'll get homework. And I know this like terrible it's on Friday, but it's not due until sometime next week. So, but I want to at least get all the classes get the homework on the same day. So, um, but yeah, let me uh, take attendance real quick. Um, Asian. Is she here today? Is it no, well, it says she is, but maybe it's just made a marker. She could be like, okay. 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 okay, so maybe she's just in like foods or something. So. Second period. Yeah, that could be. I mean, maybe she's doing like a project. I'll probably mark her right now if I smart, and she'll walk the door in like two seconds. It's going to happen. Okay. I can feel it. She's going to walk. All right. So, um, real quick here. Um, uh, let's jump right in. Let's see. Is this working? Yesterday we talked about polyhedra faces, edges, and vertices. Any questions on that? Okay, hopefully we know what those are. Prisms today, that's our goal. Can we know how to name them? Do we know how to how the setup works and how the different types of them? Then we're going to talk about pyramids today and the different names of pyramids and what the book has. I think I have a couple pictures of them. Okay, Because uh, I just kind of hinted at them yesterday, but now we're going to the formal definitions. Once we're done with that today, then we're going to get into those uh, those histories of these things. So I'm going to show you some histories of pyramids and stuff, which I kind of like. Then we're going to get to the formulas and stuff. But now yesterday, we also talked about the conics, the cones, the curves. The types of conics are like um, a cylinder, a uh, cone, a sphere. Those are the conics. Does everyone have a question with those? The cones, conics? Okay, we're going to get to those later. That's going to be like one of the last things we talk about today. And then uh, we talked about the platonic solids yesterday. So those are the regular polyhedra, the very, very special ones like tetrahedras and dodecahedras and stuff. Hopefully everyone kind of knows those. Um, did, it, did anyone bring like an example of the icosahedron? I, I don't know if it's this class. The, the, the die from Dungeons and Dragons? I didn't bring mine. Okay. There's somebody else going to bring it, so I didn't know which class it was. All right. Um, but the goal today, before we leave, is to talk about surface area and volume for the first time. I want to get to those today. So you know the formulas. Those formulas will be on this board the next test you take. Uh, retakes for tests, if you're going to do that still, uh, make sure you're coming and spend a minimum of 10 minutes with me. It's got to be before after school. This week was kind of train wreck with homecoming stuff. But um, next week, make sure you're getting that taken care of. Don't wait too long, because after you know a week or so, I'm not going to allow you to do it anymore. Okay? All right. Uh, first thing, let's talk about the polyhedra. Let's go to the, like, the prisms first. So um, types of polyhedra, again, was a prism. Okay, that was the first one, right? We talked about that. Prisms, by definition, are polyhedra with two parallel congruent faces called the bases of a picture. So here's a, here's a picture I showed you yesterday, right? Whatever two walls are equal, they're congruent and parallel, that's the name of that prism. So on the top, you can tell these are the ones that are parallel, the, the top and bottom. What is that shape? Pentagon. Pentagon, it's, so it's a pentagonal prism. That's what we call it. It's whatever that main shape is. So you do need to know the names of the polygons. Now, so triangle, quadrilateral, um, he, uh, pentagon, hexagon, heptagon, octagon. You do need to know those still. Especially when you get to surface area, you need to know them. Okay? Pyramids. 
That's the next one we are going to talk about today, and get to those specific names of those. The pyramids are a polyhedron where it has a polygonal base, and that's how you name it, whatever that polygon is on the bottom that it sits on. But then the other walls have to be triangles that go up to a point. They go up to a vertex. On a prism, the walls, the other walls are not triangles, they're actually rectangles. That's how a prism works. So all the other walls are rectangles, so that's kind of easy. Okay, you know past me? Yep. Excellent. Put it back there. Put it on. A little basket. Perfect. Okay, so pyramids, um, we name them by the polygons on the bottom. So here's an example of a pyramid. So this one we talked about yesterday was uh, it's either a square pyramid or a rectangular pyramid because of the idea that the bottom's a rectangle. Um, so that's that's how you name them. Now, the solids that are not, this is the cones and cylinders, and these are the these are the objects that are not considered polyhedra because they have curved edges. Okay. Yesterday we talked about this one, the sphere, and uh, the movie was Interstellar. I think we talked about that in class yesterday with uh, that space movie that talks about spheres themselves, um, from the uh, Rosen Bridges for wormholes. They talk about actual spheres the entrance of them. Uh, I thought that was kind of a cool way to talk about it. But the goal today is to focus on prisms and polyhedra. But if you have any questions on these, especially when we get to the, the last slide today, we have formulas on these, how to find like volume and surface area. We need to or uh, you just need to ask how it works, especially on circles. We're going to talk about a lot of different things today. Okay, we ready to go? Okay, let's talk about the prism here. Okay, so based on the, the shape of their bases, a triangular prism. Okay, so we're talking about just prisms now for a round. A triangular prism is where the, it's a prism where the bottom is a perfect triangle like this. It looks like a tent, if you will. It's not a pyramid. The reason why it's not a pyramid, the top, this top didn't come to a single point, a singularity. It's actually like, it's, there's two points on the top. So it's a triangular prism. It's got a triangle for the base. You can see the bases are actually the fronts. Those are the ones that are parallel. And all the other walls are rectangles. That's how you know it's a prism instead. And the other thing is it didn't come to a point. I mean, that's obvious. So that's a triangular prism. Okay, a tent. But the bases are the ones that are parallel and they're the same shape. So that's why it's a triangle. The next one, a rectangular prism, where the front and back or the bottom and top are rectangles, and their other walls are rectangles as well. It, it's not a cube though. It doesn't have to be a perfect like die, like we talked about yesterday, like that. Um, what was that? Um, hexahedron. That's the one we talked about yesterday. It was a cube. This is just a rectangular prism where the other walls are rectangles. They're not perfect squares. It's a rectangular prism. Pentagonal prism, that was the one I showed you earlier. Here it is. The top and bottom are pentagons, the other walls are rectangles. Okay, questions on the, the prisms themselves? Like how you name them? So, pretty straightforward. I know these, these are kind of tough to draw, but I just thought it was important that you get to see some of these shapes, especially like the triangular prism. It's, it's hard for people to imagine that without seeing a pyramid. It's not a pyramid, it's like a tent. All right, now let's get to the pyramids. So if you go to a pyramid, a triangular pyramid has a triangle on the bottom of it. It's this one. That is not like the Pyramid of Giza, like the big pyramids in Egypt. There's a few that are triangles, but some of them are not. They're more like square pyramids. We'll get to those here in a second, or rectangular pyramid. But a triangular, a triangular pyramid has a triangle for the base, and then all the other walls go up to a point. And the other walls are triangles. The, the left here, the right, and then the back. Or the back is back there. So it's a triangular pyramid. They don't all have to be the same triangle. They can be different triangles. So that thing can be leaning off to the side. A rectangular pyramid, where the bottom's a rectangle. Right? That would be like the Pyramid of Giza. It was a perfect rectangle for the bottom. In fact, Pyramid of Giza, the bottom's actually a square. So it's like, it was really, really well constructed. I'll show you pictures of that here a little bit. Okay. Next one, the pentagonal pyramid. So the bottom's a pentagon. You can see it. So it's got actually like five walls to it. 
there's five faces of the pentagon, so there has to be five triangles going out to a singular point. And we can go to any shape you want. You can go to octagonal pyramid, you can go to any ones you want. I just thought that was kind of interesting that you need to see that. You need to see these different shapes, and they can call them different names. Do, do we feel more comfortable with how you name a prism or a pyramid? Okay, now the thing we're going to be doing at the very end is how do you find like surface area? How do you actually find the numbers that would tell you like the, the amount of space on the walls or the volume on the inside of it? We have formulas for that. They get kind of difficult. I'm sticking with the easy ones because I'm not going to have you do these crazy ones like this. This is like super difficult to calculate for an analog prism. That's something we can eventually learn later. Okay, we're good with those though? Pyramids and prisms? Okay, let's talk about pyramids more. I got some different examples of the pyramids. So like the Great Pyramid of Giza, the one I kept representing. This is the one that's right next to Cairo in Egypt. It's like the most famous ones. There's three of them. Um, they're huge. What you're seeing here is this picture. These are people. This is back in the, this picture was taken back in the 80s, not by me, it was just from the internet. But back in the 80s, you could actually go up, climb it, go walk on it, go inside. It was a tourist thing. Nowadays, they have it all fenced off because of terrorism, so you can't actually walk into them. Uh, but it's, it's big. Like, if I zoom in here, this is going to get kind of blurry. Uh, but if I zoom in, look at the size of this thing. Like, these people are staying quite a ways from it. In fact, you can see somebody actually standing right there on a brick on one of the, the actual molds. They're about, each of those stones that are on the bottom are about six feet tall. They're tall bricks. Like when you're climbing, it's a workout to get on that thing. The door is, to get in is over here. It's right here if you can see the shadow. So you have to actually, you can actually see people climbing up to go inside. Um, it takes a while to get there. Um, I don't know if I have the picture here. Um, there was a kid, I think it was two years ago, got in trouble with the, um, the, uh, the Egyptian government. Um, actually scaled the fence, jumped over the fence, ran up to the pyramid, security guards were chasing him, and he climbed all the way to the top. He climbed all the way to the top. And they didn't do anything, they let him climb because they knew he had to come down at some point. Took him like the better part of eight hours to climb to the top. And that was like him consistently climbing. It's extremely tall. <laughs> like, it's, it's multiple stories. When you actually see him on the top, you can see he's sitting on the top, dangling his feet to the next brick, which is down below him. And it, it's steep. And what, all he did, all he wanted to do was climb to the top and take a picture of Cairo from the top. Because no one has ever stepped on the top of that thing since, you know, when it was probably built. No one's ever climbed to the top before. So he was one of the first kids in modern history to actually do it. Um, the picture he took was gorgeous. So I, I wonder if I can find that picture for you. But... It was gorgeous. He sat on the top, snapped a photo of Cairo at night where all the lights were lit up. The pyramids have spotlights on them so you can see them at night. And when he came down, he was arrested, obviously. Uh, but the federal government, or not the federal government, but the Egyptian government, when they, when they saw his photos that he took, they let him go as long as he agreed to the rights that he could publish the pictures. Because they were beautiful. They actually went to the Museum of Natural History for them. So it was, it was one of those things like, it had a happy ending, like they were actually really happy with the photos he took, but they weren't happy with the fact that he scaled the fence and climbed it. But he was a young kid, he was like 13. It took him forever to climb it. So, um, but this is, uh, this is the Great Pyramid of Giza as well. There's three of them. Um, I want you to notice the top. You see the top's kind of a different color. Um, the reason why the top's a different color is because the whole pyramid itself used to be covered in limestone. Limestone is this white, chalky material, and the reason why um, pharaohs did that is so that during the day, you couldn't actually look at the pyramid because it would reflect light so bad it would actually burn your retinas. It would actually almost blind you to look at it um, because it was a burial chamber. It was supposed to be like, you know, revered by men. So it was covered in limestone. Well, the idea is that why it looks like this now is because of sandstorms. Stans sandstorms in, in Egypt are so big, they're huge. They have winds that can go up to 100 miles an hour. It's kind of like a hurricane, basically, of sand. And it sand blasts the limestone right off. It's literally peeling this limestone right off the, the Great Pyramid. And, but the pyramid is so tall that it pokes out of the cloud line. 
So it, you, you can actually see the peak outside of a sandstorm. Um, and that's why the top isn't actually peeled away yet. Um, it's, and that's why the pyramids eventually moved away from like these great pyramid styles, because it took, number one, a lot of workers to do it. Um, it took a lot of manpower. Um, it took a lot of bricks itself. And these things, when you could see it outside of a sandstorm, like you'd see the peak, you knew where to walk so you could grave rob because they had gold just stuffed in there. So they made them smaller so then the sandstorm would go over them and eventually they would be buried. Um, so that's why the Great Pyramids were never like replicated because it was just, it wasn't cost efficient. Eventually the pharaohs moved to like the Valley of the Kings where they were eventually buried so that they were like hidden in the sides of walls and stuff. Um, I think right now they're doing a lot of um, archaeology about some of these tombs that they're still finding like other like chambers off the sides using infrared sensors to see where doorways are and stuff in these chambers. Like in the Great Pyramid of Giza, it's like, it's, I think it's on this one, there's like in this corner over here, because um, they're still trying to figure out how they built it, they have an idea like they spiraled up and then spiraled back down, placing bricks in very precise spots so that they could build it and it'll be complete when we get to the bottom. But there's this one area in this corner where they use an infrared because they're trying to like scan the, the pyramids themselves to see how they're kind of put together. And there's like an actual doorway, like right here, that it's not visible by the naked eye, but the bricks are showing that it's a different temperature reading. And it actually looks like a door. So there's little things about the pyramids they're still finding out. Like one of the things they just did um, about three or four months ago is they actually did a satellite like depth scan of the pyramid and they found there's a big air chamber like up here in the middle and they don't know why on the inside. They don't know if the, the, the their actual like stones are like like breaking down so they're like crumbling or if there's an actual chamber that they haven't visited yet. So and they can't get to it because they don't want the whole thing collapsing. So I mean there's still some weird stuff about these pyramids and they're incredible when you see the design of them. Um, here's a sandstorm. This is a picture of a sandstorm that goes through 100 mile an hour winds. If you were to actually stand out in a pretty violent one, uh, this is taken by the military, um, US military, but um, um, it can sandblast, sandblast your skin off because of the violence of the sand. Um, they use sandblasting to pull like paint off cars. Like, that's intense. And that's why when you see these pictures, like why, why it doesn't hit, like that's really tall. That storm. These are these are buildings where people are standing. That's a tall storm that you can't get. And they go. They can come across land. The winds are about 100 miles an hour or so, but the storm will actually can approach cities at almost 600 miles an hour. You can't outrun. Like if you see it on the horizon, it's probably too late. You probably can't get away from it. So what they always tell people is like when you see a sandstorm coming up, get indoors. Um, if you're in a vehicle, stay in your vehicle and just shut the windows. Um, if you happen to be outside and you can't get back to a building or a car, you're supposed to bury yourself in the sand, so it doesn't it doesn't literally kill you. When it hits, so it's it's violent because um, it, it literally travels over the entire Sahara Desert, so it builds up it builds up steam and it builds up speed because the winds come across the desert and just that's why the sands are constantly moving. That's why they're still finding like they're still finding constantly um, pyramids that are out in the middle of the Sahara. Because after a big sandstorm was by, they're uncovered. They're like, the sand has moved, so now you're starting to see the pipes, or like the, the pinks of a pyramid. Um, there's still a lot out there that they haven't found yet. So, I mean, the Egyptian government's still searching, I mean, but it's, it's nearly impossible. Sand's constantly moving, you can't plot it. Um, I know a lot of researchers, um, when they first had Google Earth, um, was a big thing where you could use satellites. People were using Google Earth to find new ones because you could see them through the pictures on Google Earth, and then they would try to travel there. So, it's pretty impressive. But, um, oh, let me zoom out here. Can't see that one. So let's zoom out. Okay, here's the three pyramids, the Great Pyramids of Giza. Um, they're lined perfectly with the stars of Orion. Um, Orion's belt is a winter constellation for us. Um, so during the winter, you'll see the three stars that are like south of us, usually. It travels across the sky as so the Earth rotates, but it's usually south. There's three very bright stars in the sky. That's Orion's belt, it's a constellation. And these three are perfectly lined up with it. The three stars in the sky, two of them are very bright, and one's kind of dim, and it's offset a little bit. So these are supposed to represent that. In fact, there's 
in the chambers themselves, the burial chambers on the inside, there's this one little air vent, and I'll show you a picture of that here in a minute. The air vents go look up in the sky from the actual burial chamber, and it actually looks right at the star. The star's right in view of what it's supposed to be matched up with. Like, it's incredible engineering. Um, uh, but the inside of the pyramid, like, look at the size of this thing. Like, you're seeing the Eiffel Tower, which is massive. Um, you're seeing it compared to the Eiffel Tower. Um, you're seeing it compared to uh, the Statue of Liberty, which is a very big statue. You're seeing it compared to some other stuff. Um, yeah, like um, in Brazil, um, uh, Rio de Janeiro, I should say, the uh, uh, Passion of the Christ kind of statue. You're seeing it like normal, normal planes. You're seeing other heights and towers. Um, if I compare this to other modern buildings like the Burj Khalifa in uh, Dubai, that's like five times taller than this. It's like super tall, it's almost like a mile high. So it's like incredible the buildings that we build nowadays. But I mean, the pyramid's huge. That's why it took that kid eight hours to climb it, because it's not perfect ground that he's climbing. Right? I just thought that was interesting that you need to see that, like compare it. All right. Here's the inside of the chamber of the big, you know, the Great Pyramid, right? You can see um, the burial chamber itself. So this is that doorway I was showing you earlier, where it's kind of up, it's like, you know, 50 feet up in the air. You can go in and down, there's another air chamber that's down below, it's kind of smaller. Then you go up to the Great uh, great Gallery here, this is where most of the gold would have been found. There was no gold when they opened up the Great Pyramid, because it was already grave rock a long time ago. Um, King's Burial Chamber, um, uh, they have the antechambers down below, the Queen's Burial Chamber and stuff, of uh, the setting passages. And this is a sense of scale, like how big these things are. I don't even know that number. I don't know if it's like 150 feet or something like that. It's big. Like this thing is massive. Um, when you look at the inside, this is the inside of the Great Gallery, like going up, the Grand Gallery going up. This is the picture. Um, it's very smooth. They had to install a, a ladder on the inside because it's so smooth you can't walk, you actually slide because of the sand. But they they say that um, you can't fit a credit card between the bricks. Like they're so precisely put together, you can't slide a credit card in between them. They're just tight. It's a perfect fit and it's like, it almost looks like it's laser cut, how well it's constructed. And this was, all these chambers weren't cut, chiseled out. They're, the pyramid was built and these were made as they're putting it together. They're laying the bricks perfectly so it makes this on the inside. Like it's incredible engineering. We can't even replicate it today. Um, but it's just one of those things. I'm gonna see if I can find you a picture of let's see if I can find you a picture of that kid that climbed it. I'm just starting to stop the camera here. Okay, so let me see if I can find a picture of the kid that climbed this thing. It's incredible when you see his photos. Incredible when you see this photo. Oh, last year So here's, um, let me pop this up. This is literally the photo that this kid took. And you can see the sense of scale. He's on the top of this great pyramid. Ooh, I should freeze that. Unfreeze. All right, here it is. 
It's an incredible photo. I can on the top, they're like, probably one of the first people. Look how far down that is. And it's steep. Like he's standing, I can't even see the next brick. And he's climbing that thing. Got a little more shallow at the top, but yeah, that's that's terrifying. He has gloves, he's got shoes, but yeah, he was a really young kid and he took a couple photos at the top. Um, but yeah, just it was incredible what you know what he did. Um, and that's why the Egyptian government let him go. But he was one of the first kids to ever take photos at the top. Um, let's see if I can pull up another one here. Here's his other one. He stayed up there for a while to catch his breath, which I think is really funny. Um, because uh, it took him a long time. So here's another photo of him like during the day. He, he stayed up there for a while because he didn't know what was going to happen. Uh, but here's him during the day standing up there, like just sitting there at the very, very top. He isn't going down. Like this is like several hours later because he, he didn't know because like the Egyptian government is very strict. Like he could have been executed for trespassing. So he didn't know what he should do, but he eventually had to go down. So, uh, but after they saw his photos, they, uh, they gave him a pass. He's, uh, but yeah, like that's incredible. These, these areas over here were uh, excavated where it was the uh, workers' um, uh, living spaces, so like the slaves' areas where they lived. Um, yeah, just incredible architecture and photos. So I just, I, I thought that stuff was really interesting. Um, let's see, I got... Did you take uh, you even longer to get down? Yeah, I can only imagine. It probably took forever to get back down. Here's another photo of... Let me blow this one up pretty big. This is a sense of scale for how big, like, the Leaning Tower, Big Ben, our Statue of Liberty, like, next to it. This is Khufu, this is the big pyramid, right? It's 500 feet tall. 500 feet. That's really tall. Um, I don't know anything that could possibly match that. Like in the US, maybe like some of the buildings like the Sears Tower, maybe, or I guess um, the Twin Towers that were in New York back in 2000, 2001. Like they're, they're really big. Like this is a big building, and his base is even bigger because the base is actually a square. It's like incredible architecture. I just thought this was really kind of cool stuff. So that's stuff I really like. I like the math behind it and stuff, and kind of the architecture. But I thought it was it, it was worth it. We had to see these photos. You have to see them. If you, if you never get to see this in your life, that's that's not you got to you got to see this. All right. Pretty cool. I like those a lot. All right. Let's go back to the PowerPoint here. All right, okay, yeah, all right, so. Okay, going back. Um, now, let's talk about the formulas here, okay? Formulas for surface area and volume, okay? For surface area, uh, let's talk about what surface area is. It is the, is the two-dimensional measurement of the faces, the surfaces of their solid. So every face has an area to it, like this room, has, there's volume to this room, but there's area, surface area. Um, area is like, if you looked at my floor here, it's how many tiles could fit on the floor on whatever form of measurement you're doing. There's a lot of tiles in this room. That's, that's an area of the room, right? You can use area to actually estimate, you know, cost of objects, right? That's a practical use of the area. So like in this room, if I found the area of the room, how you find it for a rectangle, so if you have a rectangle in this room, let's imagine this room is a, like a rectangle or a square, um, and you have the dimensions, you have the length and you have the width, it doesn't matter which one's which. Um, if you have those two dimensions and you multiply them together, that gives you the area of the room, how many tiles would fit in here. And all you have to do is count how many tiles go across, and then down, and when you have that count, then you can actually multiply those two numbers together. So let's say for some reason, uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So there's eight tiles going down, and there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven tiles going across. That means when I multiply them together, there's 60, there's 56 square tiles. So they go tile squared or square tiles, and it's whatever form of measurement you're doing. So if you're measuring in tiles, that's fine. If you measure in feet, it's square feet. Because maybe I don't know even know what these are. I don't think these are perfect squares, like um, one foot. I don't think. Anyway. Uh, but why it's important, if you know that, you can estimate the cost of the room. 
Because if you know it's going to take 56 tiles now that I did that calculation, I can go to the store, see how much what each one costs, and now I can do, okay, I need 56 of them. This will cost me $1,200 to put tiles in here. Or if I need carpet, I can estimate how much carpet I need. Because maybe these are one foot by one foot, right? Well, if there's, there's more than 56, by the way. But if there's 56 in here, maybe it costs me a dollar thirty-eight per square foot of carpet. And let's say these tiles are square feet. Well, I take a dollar thirty-eight times fifty-six, and it tells me on my total cost. You now that's sixty bucks. I can tell you right now, there's there's a ton. In fact, um, how many are there? Hey, okay. Jacob, do you want to count like this way? Alex, you want to count like that way? Count the tiles in the back. Just count. Start at the wall and just count across. You don't need to start in the very corner. Just start here and just count across. Yeah, keep going. You can get up and move if you need to. Count how many tiles there are. There's a lot in this room. It's about a square, I think. Almost that makes sense. I mean, that's probably about right. 26. So we take 24 times 26. That's a lot. That's like almost 600. 600 and something. 620. Ah, there it is. 6. Uh, what is that? 625. What is that? 26 times 24. 624. 624 tiles. If they're costing a dollar thirty-eight each, a dollar thirty-eight times six twenty-four, we're looking at eight hundred dollars worth of tiles. And don't get me wrong, tiles do not cost a dollar thirty-eight. They cost way more than that. So if I was going to carpet this, I think carpet on average is like three to four dollars. I've seen some carpet in like Lowe's that can go up to fifteen dollars a square foot. That's silly. Don't buy that. But let's say it's five dollars and fifty cents a square foot. $5.50 times 624, 3,000 bucks per carpet in this room alone. 3,000, $3,432 per carpet in here. Like that's, you have to look at surface area. Maybe you don't want to do that project. Maybe you don't have that type of cash. Before you start ripping out the old carpet, you got to think about costs. Paint, you see the walls in here. We paint the walls, right? That has, that has a surface to it. In fact, all the walls are painted even behind those, those marker boards. They're painted because we hung the marker boards after the fact. So you have to you can estimate the surface area of paint because a can of paint will cover so much surface area. Usually cans cover about 800 square feet. That's what they say. They say it on the can if you have really good paint anyway. Um, but it depends on the paint, right? Because if your paint's really thin, maybe you have to put a couple of coats. You have to buy a couple of cans. The paint isn't too expensive, about 30, 40 bucks. If you go to the more expensive stuff, you go up to about maybe 80, 90 bucks. I can. Um, words of wisdom if you ever have a paint room. The more expensive paint is sometimes worth it. I know that seems stupid to some people, but if you only have to put one coat on of really expensive paint, that might save you as opposed to putting on five coats of the cheap stuff. We have to buy five cans of it. So sometimes it's cost efficient. Uh, but yeah, Super Series is kind of a big one, right? I, we can guesstimate and you know, uh, approximate how much money is going to be involved to re renovate a room because of surface area and the space that's in. Okay, and you know, opposed like tiles too, like tiles on the ceiling, like that costs money. Each tile does. Or um, if you're going to paint the ceiling, or spatula where they have, like a textured surface. So it does cost money. Like, these are things you have to think about. Okay, other things we talked about is volume. Now we're not going to get into all of the formulas today. My goal is just to introduce these words tomorrow we'll get the formulas. Volume is the measurement of the amount of space that encloses a solid figure. So it's the space in this room. This room has volume to it. So the reason why you want to worry about space and volume, you want to worry about heating, cooling, you want to worry about this, um, how many objects you can put in this room. Like my desks is one thing I had to think about when I, when I had this room this year. I had to put 27 desks in here. I have to think about the room. It's really hard to put 27 desks in a room that's really small because there's only so much room I can put them before you're like up to here and I'm trying to teach in front of you. 
Right? So that's little things. To find volume, use three dimensions. We're going to get to this tomorrow. I don't want you to write this down today. But this is what we're going to look at tomorrow. I'll have this really big for you on the board. It's all the formulas we're going to use for this first homework assignment. Okay? And I'll explain them tomorrow. Tomorrow's goal is to practice this stuff. Okay? You don't need to write those down. In fact, I'm going to get rid of those so you can see. Okay? So, so we're going to look at those tomorrow. I'll have it really big. We're going to, you do need a calculator tomorrow. And good news, have all 11 back. So they came back yesterday. So, so that means we're going to use calculators tomorrow. Bring calculators, bring your books, bring notes. Okay? Perfect. Hopefully that was a little bit entertaining today, a little bit better than normal. Let's do a little bit of history. Now remember, after six period today, we go down to the gym.